Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of having to settle for mediocre are over. Welcome to Project Relationship. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. Join me as I explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, and I'm here with my partner, Ken Hamilton. Hello again. And we are, we're diving into the deep end this time. So we are working our way through the chapters of my book, Project Relationship, The Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love. And we're working through the chapters in order, which means we are at chapter eight, which is titled simply sex. And so this one's marked explicit, which means I can say words like golly and heck. Yeah, he's just a <laughs> wild one. Um, okay, so when I said at the close of the last episode that we were heading towards my area of expertise, it's because while my doctorate is in depth psychology, Jungian and um, uh, archetypal psychologies, my uh, other certification is as a, a sex educator. I'm an ASEC certified sex educator, and I I love to talk about sex. It doesn't make me uncomfortable, and I think in some ways that's my superpower. I don't feel uncomfortable talking about sex. I think sometimes my children wish I did, and what I mean is I'm really frank with them about just the basic facts, and I don't think it's something that should be hidden from children, though obviously boundaries and body autonomy should always be at the top of our list of concerns. Um, but yeah, we're just going to get into it. So we're also talking about the holidays. Holidays. And the stress and just getting through stuff. And this is a special holiday, pandemic holiday season. Yay. Do we get special, I don't know, like, is this a, does this holiday get a gold star or something? I could say it's something like the opposite of that. Yeah. I think it's important to say right off the bat then that it's okay if sex is the furthest thing from your mind right now. Sure. It's always okay if that's true. But especially at a time like this, if you're feeling out of sorts with yourself or or not in not in alignment with your typical um, experience of sexuality, yeah, nothing really feels typical right now. Everything feels topsy-turvy. We're what in month like 10 of pandemic time. And even in the easiest of years, it's easy to get out of sync during the holiday season around sex. We, I mean, sex can get thrown off by apparently little things. I mean, it, it so much depends tiny. on who, little things. <laughs> well, not tiny. Um, it depends on your particular your history, your psychology, what what affects sexuality for you. So little things can knock it out of alignment. And the holidays aren't little things. There's a lot going there on. There can be a lot of baggage as well as stress. And those are two different things in my book. Stress is, for me, what's mm -hmm. happening right now. It's the pressures around us. Yeah. And the baggage, or what I'm, what I'm sure. thinking of as baggage, yeah. is all the stuff, the long bag that John Bly said we are dragging behind us and shoving stuff into, all of that. When we get to the holiday season, something like sex, which for us has been really, I mean, part of the foundational, mm -hmm. it's like the rock that our relationship is built upon. For us, our, yeah, our, our it intimacy. It was part of how it's, we wound up together. It's part of our intimacy. It's part of our story. And so it's, it's visible. So it's when it's notable not, in our relationship. <laughs> when it's not in alignment. <laughs> When we're not in sync with each other, boy, does it cause trouble. Yep. I think that the worst one for me, um, well, the very early years were complicated. Our relationship for was sure. really complicated. I think we'll get into talking about how complicated our relationship is. So it's a, a later date. I think you'll all enjoy that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's messy. But even during some years that were really great, We've been out of sync. Like, yep. I'm thinking about um, 
In 2018, we had all kinds of ups and downs because you lost your job. You'd had that job for what, 18 years? Something like that. Ken's a software developer and he'd had his job for yeah, like, 19 ever. years. Yeah. Something. And um, he just went into work one day and it was gone. He was laid off. Um, boom. And I was in grad school. So, you know, he's supporting this family of, of all nine of us. Um, and it was just, just, uh, it was, the it was rug, a shock. Yeah. The rug pulled out shock. from under us. Um, they cut like 40% of the workforce and it was a big day that we did not see coming. And the interesting thing that happened is I, you, I turned toward you in that moment. Yep. And I was really proud of myself. I had a lot of panic. The very first thing I did was lay down on the floor. And I thought the conversation was a really good one. We hand, yeah. We handled it really well. We handled well that. When we I turned told you. towards. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was such a strange year. And mm. I'm starting there. So that actually happened um, like July 1st, I think. July 1st. But it led to six months that culminated <laughs> in a holiday season that was strange in another way. So when you lost your job, I turned towards, and one of the ways I turned towards was to, um, well, get in alignment with you in a way that really works for it, you. Yep. You are so, a high touch person. You like a lot of touch. You specifically like a lot of sexual touch. And I had a lot of free time. <laughs> and all of a sudden, so, even though we have seven kids, you had a lot of free time, which we'd never had. No, we not had run ever. a business together. We'd both While been working. Having a job we had grad and... school and all of these things all piled. So, and it, there was the other strange thing that happened is I wrote the first draft of my dissertation proposal and I wrote it very quickly and it went into the hands of my reviewer. So I didn't have anything to do all summer while they reviewed it. It was like eight, nine, ten weeks, I think. It was a long time. Where for, I mean, you for... were looking for a job and I was you know, writing a little bit, but it was the most time we'd had to really look at each other yeah. ever in our relationship. And the kids were pretty stable. Everything was good. Um, and we had, well, we had sex every day, at least once a yep, day. We did. And, and it was going really well. It was great. It was an awesome summer. We spent time by the by, the by lake. our lake. Yeah. The, the lake that we like up in the hills there. And yeah, it was really weird. But we also had this huge stress where we had no idea when or how you were going to find a new job because yep. you hadn't looked in a, for a job in so long. I was just not, I, w I needed to write my dissertation. I was so close to the end of my doctoral program. We didn't want to push that off. Yeah. So there was some time where we were, we both had free time, but then you started to have some pressures come back in Yeah. and I didn't. I mean, I, I had to find yeah, a I job, mean, but <laughs> but um, you were doing what you could. But do. I was doing what you I were, could do. You were spending the time doing that, and it was proceeding okay. It was just taking a, some your pace. So we were having a different a different experience of, for part of that time, but for us, having frequent sex kept us yeah it on was, the same page. It was great. I felt like we were we were we had a great summer. We were not there were no arguments to speak of because yeah, we just kept turning towards each other yep. and connecting and that left us in a really, uh, uh, sex for us is pretty soulful. It's yep, like, I it's, feel that. yeah, it's pretty intense that way. So that was great. But then, um, well, my reviewers came back and I had a huge project to do. My yep. first draft of yeah. my dissertation was a hot mess. My, a well, not the dissertation, too. but the the first draft of the lit review was a mess. I needed to rework the whole thing. I just hadn't seen the angles that I needed to come in at it from. And it was very stressful. I felt terrified. And you still had all this time on your hands. And I needed to get to work. And that lasted like... I think we got about four or five weeks. So we were heading on to Thanksgiving time. Yep. And you, I found you sitting in my office one day in a, ro in a rocking chair. Yep. Just maudlin. Oh, just sighing. I'm and just so sad. Don't, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I feel so down. I feel like. 
You look like a puppy uh, like, who had lost I, its own puppy. I don't have any erotic <laughs> puppy who's lost its own puppy. <laughs> I feel like I don't have any erotic energy and I'm down and I haven't so been having apart. sex <laughs> and I don't. And she's like, and I'm just staring at you. I've sat, had sex at least once a day for like three months straight. <laughs> What are you talking about? I try not to laugh at you about sex. Yeah, but, but that geez. was a hard one. <laughs> it was. So we'd had, I think we'd gone up like a couple weeks right then. I was really focused. Yep. I was getting up every morning at 5 a.m. starting to write. I was super focused. I was I was dialed in. And so I, we were a little out of sync, but it, it had just been a little teeny bit of yep. time. And you totally panicked. I did. As if, yeah, as if you'd. We're never going to have sex again. Like, like it was yeah. just all well, over. And you weren't blaming me. You were like, that's it. I have no erotic energy. That's it. I pointed out to you that you were unemployed. You were the head of a household, um, or the the full the 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 wage earner of our household, because my work was just a teensy little sliver of our income. And you didn't have a job right now. And maybe that was affecting you. Maybe. And but more importantly, that your vision of what our sex life was, wasn't actually was, was not right. accurate. Yep, it was wrong. Uh, it wasn't accurate. So you were down on yourself for something that wasn't, it wasn't happening. Right. But then we had a great conversation that's really at like at the center of this chapter in the book. Um, and it's a conversation we had had lots of times. But it's a conversation that bears having lots and lots, lots of, times. of times. So I think it's like one of the most magical conversations you can have with any partner, really of any any um, length of time. Like it doesn't matter whether this is your lifelong partner or somebody that you're having a short term relationship or a casual relationship with. This is to me like this is big stuff. So the conversation is a pr it's a simple premise. It's simply what do what you are, mean when you say sex? What is sex to you? What is sex to you? When are you having sex and yeah. when are you not? <laughs> How do you know? Right. Yeah. And the first time we asked each other that question for real. Now, we'd we'd had conversations around it, but the first time we were really presented with it, we were at a um, sexual attitude reassessment, which I call, also called a SAR, um, because I had started a certificate program in sexuality education. And we decided to go to a SAR together. And so we were presented with the question, so what is sex? And as I have come to find out when I sit in rooms full, filled with people studying sex, studying um, therapy, studying any number of subjects, if you ask people what sex is, you get the same number of definitions as people you have writing <laughs> yep. definitions, yeah. which makes it a great question to ask. I mean, it proves to be quite challenging if you're trying to perform research in this area. That's a different issue. But when it comes to trying to have great sex, I can't think of a more beneficial conversation because we did that at a SAR in Seattle yep. and then had the most mind blowing week yes. following it. Yep. Because all of a sudden our conception of what sex was. Our imagination of what whoa. it was and what it could be because we had opened up to each other. And what I think is really cool is so. We thought you, we already had too. We thought we already had. <laughs> and we had. When we had, but the, there was so it many all worked layers. out nicely that, you know, like you, you said a bunch of things and I said a bunch of things and the interaction of them was. There was like an entire, oh, added. transcendent function. Transcendent function. Right. They added so the two things and the Jungian concept of transcendent function is that whenever two beings, two souls, two ideas, two whatever principles, principles meet. Um, there is the potential for the third thing, the thing that could not be without these two things. And these two things are often, they sometimes they don't even seem compatible or they're polarized or they're, they're far apart. There's, and yet, there's still a third thing that can. The relationship yeah. between them creates the potential for the third thing. And so we and had. That was amazing. That's what, that's what we experienced. And it changed everything for us in our relationship. It changed our sex life. Yep. One of the things that came up for me in that conversation, that very first one, was that um, I didn't realize how much I had put you into a box of masculinity. 
I didn't realize how very much I had just presumed that you were like a man. What the heck did I even mean by that? Yeah. And by the way, we never say this and we really, really should. My pronouns are she, her. Oh, yes. And I am he, him. And we should him. say that at the start of every every episode. We I'll really try to should. remember to do that. Um, and that said, I don't fit in a box of masculinity all that well. You So you don't, but it it shocked me to find how much I had presumed your sexual impulses and your sexual desires mm -hmm. to fit into um, a checklist of like what guys like. And now this was before I had studied as deeply as I have now. Um, and still I recognize that my conceptions of gender are massively like they, they need exploding and, and turning over and um, deconstructing all the time. But around this issue of what people want, all the more so. I, it's I was shocked to find how um, how limited my imagination was, and how much I had forgotten to ask you. Yeah, and I mean, admittedly, you'd asked me almost nothing because you had very few words. Yeah, because one anything. of the one of the differences between us coming into the relationship was, yep, she loves to talk about sex in every circumstance, and in in my life, it was almost never a suitable topic of conversation in the places that I was, and so I never did. Yeah, your so whole I life, never, my like whole your family life, of origin, my your family first of origin marriage, never your, talked about it. Yeah. My first marriage, my friends, they were just not people that spent time thinking and talking about sex. And I lucked out because my, my parents did a lot of things wrong, um, but they managed to raise me in a way that um, treated sex as just sort of a normal thing. It didn't, it, yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't particularly taboo. And, Lucky my, me. and my parents never talked about it at all. There was no taboo laid out. But the fact that they never talked about it at all created the taboo alone. That like that's all you need. You never talk about it. Clearly, there's something wrong there. Can't, can't so we touch that. So we were walking so up to this thing this different. that we wanted to do together, have sex with all that. Yeah, whatever it was. And then proceeded to have a relationship um, and have sex for quite a few years. So that would put, you know, like we've, we'd have like three or four years of having sex before we had this conversation before, yeah. where we explicitly said, uh, so exactly what do you mean when you say we're having sex? Yeah. Because, well, our definitions well, didn't our definitions, actually line they up. They didn't line they up at all. Because my imagination was so constrained that um, my definition of sex was so simple that it meant I was hardly ever having sex. And my <laughs> and mine was actually much simpler than I thought it was too. Um, I I thought of myself as open minded, but um, but I also thought that there was there was a lot of orgasm focus. Mm -hmm. A lot of orgasm Which focus is, that I didn't, that now is just not present in my definition of sex at all, yeah. personally. But um, I didn't even know it was there until I knew to question. So right. the interrogation yeah. of my own idea, yep. this wasn't even just a conversation between us. But I remember sitting there trying to define sex and thinking, okay, this index card is not big enough. Because we had been given index cards to write our de definitions down on. And, yeah. oh, I started writing and realized... I'm going to need more space. I, <laughs> it was, it was shocking. Mm -hmm. And then we compared and contrasted and we were in different groups for the SAR. So I didn't actually see your definition and you didn't see mine in inside that container. But, you know, we spent the next, the next several days talking about this. Yeah. And it, something fascinating turned up. And that is that you are really, um, you have this, or at least this is how I, I heard it when you described it. Like, you aren't orgasm focused. Not really at all. Mm. Uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> We'd been having sex for like three years at this three, four, four and a um, half years. Yeah. <laughs> at that point. And I just assumed you were. Right. And so I'd been trying to have a kind of sex with you that 
possibly, I'm not sure we've ever talked about this, might have even felt a little pressury to you. Um, I may have been trying to draw an orgasm from you, like I think when you weren't did, see, even seeking it. I, yeah. So it, I didn't feel pressure so much as a missed connection. Like you were trying to accomplish yeah. something I wasn't. And I was trying to accomplish something that I don't didn't even know whether it lined up with what you wanted. But the thing is, I like to have sex for a long time. Orgasm seeking is sort of contraindicated <laughs> in that situation. Which it's is true. I am more of a quickies kind of girl. Because I am very <laughs> I am very sensation focused. I like the sensation, so I like that to extend for a long time. And so, and, so, and this is these are discussions we had that we found out so much about each other. Yeah, I had and so much that was then practically applicable to making our sex life better and also to understanding the things we could do when we were feeling out of alignment with each other. Yeah. So knowing what sex was and knowing that for us, sex is a is a unifying act. Yeah. Brings us together. Well, what can we do? Like, what are the things we can do? Do we have to take off all our clothes and get in bed? And right. to turn out the lights and, you like, know, it was there a whole thing <laughs> which we had that to was, do? That was obvious for us. We were both like, well, no, obviously not. So we actually sort of walked back from that. We were like, okay, yeah. so it, we, it doesn't need to be in the bedroom and it doesn't need to be, you know, in bed and it doesn't need to be um, fully undressed and it doesn't need to be, I, I don't know. We just sort of started taking mm -hmm. off the layers of what it was. Well, and it doesn't have to be orgasm focused. Right. Like there are these, these, these features that we could unhook which then let our imagination of what sex could be between us expand, which gave us more opportunities to do the thing we like to do. Yeah. Yeah. It. So I wound up writing um, a little bit about this in the book because this, the the um, in chapter eight, there's a, there's a section where I, I suggest that you, if possible with your partner, define sex and you have to really give yourself some time. Like what, how do you know when sex has started? Because that was one of the first things that I thought of, like, okay, surely we can agree on this. When has sex started? And instantly we were like, wait a minute. Oh. <laughs> How nope. do I know? Wow. Um, and somebody very dear to me, um, MC Tove, um, told me once that, you know, sex is like the crock pot. Like, you know, right. it could start, it could start first thing in the morning with a simple text. And then you simmer it all day. So when did you really start having sex? If if that's the image that you're using, right? And that really, uh, that illuminates the, the wide variety of experience that it can be. Right. So once we take away the idea that orgasm seeking is like the definition of sex or. Um, Which if it is, let it be. If it, it wasn't for if us. If it is, but it wasn't. And, but we also realized pretty quickly that. It also didn't have to necessarily be, well, it definitely didn't need to be penetrative. That came up right away. Like, yeah. no, like that doesn't even make any sense. For one thing, I'm, I'm not heterosexual. I'm, I'm pansexual. Yeah. So that doesn't even make any sense to right. me. I, it, and it never did. So, okay. So then we started pulling off all these different, um, like, assumptions that we had been making without even realizing it yeah. and pretty quickly got to the, okay, so how do you know when sex is happening? And I remember going to dinner with you and talking about it and then going home and talking about it and having sex and then, and then, and then getting up in the morning and still being talking about this because yeah. it, because it fascinated me, just the idea that maybe it wasn't really even a separate act. Maybe it's just a state of being for us, like that we're relating and that there is no clear delineation. Maybe Christmas doesn't come from a store. Maybe <laughs> Christmas is a little bit more. <laughs> oh no! The Grinch is sorry. Never gonna be I don't the mean same. to ruin the Grinch. Are we like Dabu Daring now? Oh, go oh, here. <laughs> uh, sorry, everyone. Um, <laughs> but, but, but that. Uh, so, by having the discussion, we could we could know what. Well, by having the discussion, we could keep having the discussion. Yeah, and which it's, it's been. It's ongoing. So now it, this is 
this is now uh, six years ago. Six, seven, I know something in that in that range. Don't look Gosh, at me. I, I forgot know. we were having sex for three months the day next the day later. So. Oh, that's true. Right. <laughs> okay. I won't ask you to do that part of the memory. Um this has been an ongoing discussion. And even now so it it's also it's not static. So not there's no all. right or wrong nope. amount of sex to have. There a, a sexless partnership is completely valid as long as as long as you're on the same page with each other and and there's there's um collaboration or and and consent around what it is to be having a relationship yeah. is like everybody whatever. getting like what they want out of the relationship have you and if not about what it is? have you figured out how to be okay with and, what you're yeah. getting or what you're not because you've been in a sexless marriage you know what that's like mm -hmm. and i i have struggled with drive differences with partners it's hard, but the real hard part is the feeling of not being in sync. It's not so much whether you're having sex or how much sex you're having or um, if something's interrupting the, I mean, you know, going through grief or infertility or any number, a million things. A million disrupting Or a pandemic things. at the holiday when you've maybe lost your job and 10 other things have happened. It's totally valid to just not Yep. feel it or not even want to feel it or or want to have a different kind of sex or maybe just want to masturbate or not or not have to put a lot of effort in yep. who knows but 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 the discussion um well okay so, you, so for me you needed a lot of permission to say the words oh i really did and to find uh, our did. shared vocabulary Mm -hmm. and which was fun and you know kind of frustrating sometimes because you were trying to talk about something and not sharing the vocabulary made it difficult sometimes i would say something and you would interpret it according to how you use the words yeah so let's get more specific here actually figuring out which words yeah work for us yeah. like so so what do you call your body parts mm -hmm. what do you like to say when you're when you're feeling aroused what words do you like to say and we could get very, very graphic and explicit here. And I'm actually appreciating that we're not because this episode doesn't actually have to it be absolutely doesn't need to filled be. with those words for people to know. About it's about what words. you want to use. Yeah. yeah. But we didn't actually know that. I think we didn't realize that we we could intentionally choose a shared vocabulary and a shared definition of sex. And once we started establishing those things it became part of the conversation that has let us have some really fantastic adventures mm -hmm. and and i didn't know that that was possible i i kind of assumed that it would get boring after a while there, but the conversation you, means yep. nothing could be further you from would you would talk about it all the time and i mean i know <laughs> so you would talk about your concerns that it would get boring and I mean, you would always talk about me getting bored with you and my... I, I would get worried. You yeah. would get worried about that. And my response to, to you would be, that's not going to happen because, first of all, you're an extremely complicated person and you're you're not simple. But the more we talk about it, the more it develops. We're not having the same sex we were six years ago or a year ago yeah. or a month ago. That's it, true. Because we we talk, things change. Um, That's true. Yeah, and we, and we, we sometimes it, we shockingly find something out. We're like, whoa. It's okay. been, yeah. Whoa. It, it's, <laughs> Didn't know that, that was in there. there. that transcendent function, that third thing. There's the two of us. And then the relationship's like, well, here, where did that come from? <laughs> which is um, amazing. Which is amazing and exciting. So the knowing what it is and talking about it with your partners um well, for me, it's brought a tremendous amount of joy and sex and joyful sex and just <laughs> fun. Like it's excitement That's and growth what for me. and I change feel without fear. Calm. Yep. I feel this calmness calm. of like, well, yep. when it's not working, we'll talk. Yes. Okay. That's as good a place as any to stop. I, we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. Um, we will definitely circle back to this yes. um, in the future. And... Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. I hope that if people walk away with one thing, it's that finding a way to 
communicate with your partner or partners is it, like that's that's, that's to, to me that's the key. that's the secret sauce yeah however that's going to go for you um yeah so we'll we'll come back to this but here's to some good sex to wrap and up some 2020 good conversations <laughs> yes <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be honored if you could drop a rating and a quick review. That'll help more people find us and get to know what kind of stuff we're talking about. In episode eight, Ken and I talked about sex and how we never could have imagined that a simple conversation that started with just the question, what is sex anyway? could put so much excitement and possibility into our relationship for years. Talking about sex with your partner or partners, it doesn't come easily to everyone, but in our experience, the courage to create shared meaning and a shared vocabulary about sex, even many, many years into the relationship, it means that we can handle the dry spells and the stressors with a sense of humor, and it all just goes a little bit more smoothly. Join us next time when Ken and I get into some big stuff once again. But this time we're talking about learning to fight with love. Learning to fight at the holidays. We are very, very different people with very different ideas about how to handle disagreements. We've had a lot to learn together about how to fight without dehumanizing each other accidentally. Learning to do this better has been quite a process. <laughs> so until next time, remember, relationships can be messy. And that's good news. 